And hello, everyone. This is Jane Steele from Jane's Addiction Recovery Support Group. And today we have a very special guest speaker here. We have Bitten Johnson here from Sweden. And Bitten is a registered nurse and probably the world's best known sugar addiction specialist. She is a clinician, uh, now turned trainer, who um, uh, has created a tool called the Sugar Diagnostic which assesses whether people are harmful eaters or whether they have addiction. And she is also a um, leader of a course called the Holistic Medicine for Addictions course. And that's how I know Bitten is uh, we did that course together in uh, 2019, 2020. And I'm also sugar licensed and uh, we do a lot of uh, good work together, helping fight the good fight uh, in assessing food addiction and providing treatment plans and recovery coaching. So Bitten is here with us today to talk about her story. Uh, Bitten also identifies as being a sugar addict, a food addict in recovery. And she also, of course, has extensive experience in treatment plans and helping people. And she's got a, a proprietary uh, relapse prevention protocol, which she'll be sharing with us today as well. And then finally, um, if there's time, we'll open it up for specific questions for from anyone in the group who has anything that they'd like to comment on or discuss or, or get some special special attention with. So without further ado, Bitten, I would love to turn it over to you. Thank you, lovely Jane. That was a beautiful introduction. And um, uh, I'd like to say, uh, I feel very, very honored and flattered to be with you guys um, and share. And uh, I will share a mixture of my own experience with some of the knowledge I have through the years. Uh, doing this it's uh, 20 i mean i'm a recovering alcoholic for 36 and a half year and uh, that was you know how recovery started for me and then uh, from sugar addiction for 28 and a half years almost uh, which doesn't mean that i've been drug free from sugar and flour for 28 and a half years i used to say that uh, is it my sound that is yeah, strange. My sound I, think it, I think it's because, oh, there, it should be gone now. Oh, okay, okay. I heard myself like in stereo. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that I've been drug-free from sugar and flour for 28 and a half years. I used to say that I've had some absolutely beautiful relapses, which is uh, what taught me most about relapse. And at one point, uh, my food sponsor at that time said, uh, I said to her, okay, I give up, I quit, I'm not gonna work with this. Uh, I'm useless, worthless, you know, I can't uh, stay abstinent. So uh, I can never work with that. I can't help others. And she looked very sternly at me, you know, like sponsors can do. And she said, it was the most stupid thing I've ever heard. If you don't relapse and get out of it, how in the whole world are you gonna help other people to get out of it? This is a relapsable illness. And I just said, oh, okay, I keep it on that. I keep going then. And I did. So uh, it started with me loving sugar when I was five. And if you have listened to podcasts with me, I've told this story so many times, but I uh, tell it very shortly. I was the oldest of seven and uh, in a blue collar family, and we didn't have a lot of money for sweets. And I tell you what, I'm 70 now. So there weren't a lot of sweets when I was young not like it is today with all the stuff that is today. Uh, uh, so we didn't have that, it was very rare and we could ha have just a little bit and very, very seldom, big holidays. But I loved it, loved it, loved it. And I stole sugar cubes from my grandmother, you know, the lumps you have in your coffee. So, uh, and um, that's how it started for me. But, you know, I grew up, I was very fortunate having a mother that cooked everything from scratch. So I grew up on very wholesome, type farmer food at that time you know meat and potato and veggies and there weren't a lot of veggies either when I was young cucumbers and tomatoes is basically what we had or peas or something uh, not like today but anyway so but in my teenage year of course when I started working extra in school I could buy ice cream and chocolate and that was my drug uh, you know I've never been into flowers uh, pasta bread stuff like that not interesting at all. It makes me sluggish. I want to be speeded. So that's, you know, it was chocolate and ice cream. 
Uh, and then, of course, as a teenagers, uh, you know, I started dieting like all my friends did. And that's when things started going high wire because that's very dangerous. You know, you try to starve and then you binge and you starve and you binge. And that went through nursing school. And then somebody said to me, a little to us in nursing school, if we start smoking, you know, then we don't have so much appetite. So we started smoking and I was a nicotine addict from the first cigarette. I loved it. So then now we have sugar and we have nicotine, but I don't know anything about addiction at that time. So it was just normal, I thought. And then uh, maybe half a year later, we also thought we would drink alcohol. I wasn't starting to drink when I was very young. So I was 19 and we were going out dancing and that's when we started drinking. And I remember it was some horrible, horrible wine, like vinegar. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> I didn't like wine. I turned into whiskey later much better, much tougher, you know. So anyway, uh, I loved being drunk. Let me put it that way. I loved being high on alcohol. I was speeded on alcohol. I mean, I could dance all night, dance on the tables and be out, you know, being crazy. So I loved it. And of course, uh, at that time, you know, I could control occasions. That's the way addiction is in the beginning. You can decide when you're going to use it. But once you start one bite, boom, there you go. So that was the thing with alcohol for me. And of course, smoking and drinking, food wasn't so interesting. But then uh, I met this American guy, ended up in US to make a long story short, ended up in treatment uh, at uh, that time, what was supposed to be the best treatment center in the world called Capistrano by the Sea in Newport Beach in California. And I was furious, absolutely furious. But under it all, I was ashamed, like crazy. Me, an alcoholic? Um, at one point, I thought I didn't really want to commit suicide, but I thought, you know, I might as well disappear because there is no life. If I can't drink, what's fun in life? Nothing is fun. So that's how I felt. But uh, the more I learned, at that time, that's when we started to learn about the dopamine system and the brain. And the interesting thing was that they told me it was an illness. In Sweden, 1985, it was a psychosocial moral dilemma. Uh, it still is in a lot in Sweden. Sweden is way behind in neuroscience and addiction medicine. So I was incredibly fortunate meeting this American and ending up there and learning about the illness. But at that time, we had a very limited disease concept. It was a chronic. Uh, progressive, uh, deadly, but treatable illness. That was the disease concept at that time. Uh, it is revised by now. I don't know, but I hope, and I think Jane is showing you the ASAM disease concept, which is what we work by, that this is a physical brain illness with physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences. And it is not caused by anything such as trauma or you know any other thing. You could have a trauma, and if you have both addiction and trauma, that uh, demands a very skilled counselor that can help you deal with those things. But addiction is a primary illness. And that's why it is wrong to ask somebody, why do you eat or drink if they are an addict? Because it has to do with illness. So that's my firm belief. Uh, and the more I've studied this and the more people I have treated, which is about thousands of people today, um, uh, probably, I know for sure it is an illness. So I hope anyone that uh, feel they are ashamed over it should just get rid of the shame and the stigma. We have an illness and uh, that's the way we should treat it. So... Um, is there anything more you want to know about my story? Uh, well, I could tell you how I ended up uh, understanding I was a food addict because that was an interesting story. And at that time in Sweden, I worked with alcohol, pill and drug addicts. And I was smoking and going to AA thinking I was so good. I wasn't drinking right. And then I was listening to this American called Terry Gorski. And, um, he taught me a tremendous amount of things later, but he was coming to Sweden. And that was like, you know, 
the biggest rock star on earth were coming in into those that little addiction world that I was because he was very famous and he was a relapse prevention and relapse treatment expert. And I was working in a treatment center where we had a lot of uh, people coming from the social office and they did not like 12-step treatment because they said it was a woo-woo treatment and it was religious and it didn't help people become sober. Uh, people needed psychotherapy. They didn't understand what we was do doing working with the disease concept. So we constantly had to argue with the social officers because clients wanted to come to us and be sober and they didn't want to pay for it. So it was really a battle. But anyway, so, and also the social secretaries always said that, well, you know, people have been with you for four weeks and then they relapse. So that's why it is a useless treatment. And we try to explain that, you know, a relapse isn't a failure. It is something you need to revise in the treatment plan. And we need to work more with relapse prevention and good aftercare and all that. And they weren't listening. They said, well, we paid for four weeks and they're not sober, Baba. So when I heard that Terry Gorski would come to Sweden and talk about relapse, I thought, oh my God, I have to go there and listen to that and learn so we can help more people. So more people can come into our treatment facility. So this was 1992 in February. So anyway, um, and the day I would go, it was a snowstorm because that snowstorm in January, February, March is very common in Sweden. So I thought, because I moved back to Sweden in 88, I forgot to mention that. Uh, so anyway, uh, but so I thought, my God, I can't go down there because, you know, it was like a three hour drive on woods, wood roads in the woods. So it was very close that I stayed home, but something just urged me to go. And so I prayed that I would be safe doing that drive in the dark, in the snowstorm, and I was safe. So that was, that was a miracle. So I came down there to that, um, you know, uh, air, uh, LB, uh, bed and breakfast place where he was doing in the middle of the woods somewhere. And then I listened to Terry Gorski for two days and I was absolutely, you know, shocked. And, uh, thinking that why don't we have this knowledge in Sweden? And this is horrible. This, everybody need this knowledge. This is life-saving and that it should be included in the treatment program. So I remember, and, and, and one thing is that there, there were two things happening at that time, very important things happening. First of all, I realized I wasn't, you know, really drug-free because I was still smoking and drinking lots of coffee and I was really sloppy with my eating so if I was hungry I ate but I really didn't have a structure and you would think being a nurse you would know something about nutrition doctors and nurses know nothing about nutrition I'm sure you've all have noticed that already so I didn't know that uh, so I thought you know leaving there okay I thought shoot I have to quit smoking cut down on coffee uh, I wasn't prepared to quit, uh, cut down on coffee. And then I thought, but you know, I don't eat junk food because to me, junk food was McDonald's. And I didn't like McDonald's because I don't like bread. So chocolate and ice cream was not junk food in my world. You can hear my denial already. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then he said another thing that was very interesting. He said, uh, alcohol, pill, and drug addicts that keep eating, uh, you know, uh, junk food or having a poor eating habit, smoking and drinking coffee, they are the one that will relapse. They have a much higher risk of relapsing. And that wasn't really that strange that he said that, but something happened in my nursing head, biochemical. The word biochemistry came up. Wait a minute. I know al alcohol and drug addiction is a brain illness. And so the, the sloppy eating and caffeine and nicotine, that has to do something with the brain, with the reward center. I got that connection. I, that was another big thing that happened. So I started thinking a lot about that. And I thought, I got to know something about this. 
So anyway, I went home and I quit smoking, you know, cold turkey as the addict I am, on off, bam, bam. And of course, that's when I understood I was a sugar addict because now when I had taken that away and the alcohol was gone, had been for seven years, uh, nothing would stop me on the sugar. And also I thought that I was being really good quitting smoking and I didn't drink. So of course I could have chocolate. And I mean, I'm going to spare you the details talking about the drug anymore, but I'm telling you it was bad. It was bad. So, uh, and deep down, uh, and I remember saying to an American colleague that over here training us, and I said, I don't understand. I could quit smoking, I could quit alcohol, but I can't quit eating these special foods. And she looks at me and she said, this is, you know, sometime uh, in uh, the fall. No, it, this is sometime in the summer of 93. And I felt miserable physically and uh, mentally too miserable. She looks at me and she said, maybe you're a food addict. And I said, what? I never heard that word. So 93 in the summer is the first time I hear that word. And now I was lucky working, you know, with Americans. So I could go over to Chicago, Trinity uh, Lutheran Hospital in Chicago, where people work with food addiction, which they call food addiction. And still at that time, they talk a lot about, you know, emotional eating and, you know, we ate because we were unhappy and all that. And they didn't really understand it was a brain illness the way we do today, which I think is, you know, good that we do today, but we didn't at that time. But a lot of people started comparing it with alcoholism and drug addiction, and that was really good. And as a recovering alcoholic, I could really see that it was exactly the same. Hiding, lying, sneaking, you know, all these things were there. Uh, so uh, I understood it was an addiction deep down, even though I balked at the word. Well, but today, with all the science we have about sugar's effect on the body and mostly the brain, I prefer to call it sugar addiction. And I simply say that uh, butter seared cod has never hit my reward center. Uh, it is other things that hit my reward center. So I like to make that distinction. And uh, a lot of people too say, I'm a food addict. Well, no, I'm not addicted to food. I'm addicted to, and they can tell you what they have loss of control over. The confusing thing today is also that we have all these uh, so-called experts putting different labels on this. They say, you know, emotional eating, binge eating, volume eating, grazing, uh, you know, they have all kinds of purging, restricting and all that. And by the time, you know, uh, I'm jumping a little bit in time now, but we didn't know that at that time. Uh, today, we understand that all those behaviors are process addictions, like, you know, gambling, sex and relationship and all that, that we have developed because of the sugar addiction. And that is very clear when we do the sugar assessment that Jane mentioned in the beginning, that we see that uh, the drug comes first. The drug hits the brain and our brain and our mental and physical and psychological a uh, person starts being changed due to the drugs, drug's effect on the brain and the hampering of the brain. So all these behaviors are our way of trying to control the craving, trying to you know get rid of the excess eating. We start dieting. We start doing all kinds of crazy things, you know. And uh, there is a researcher in Sweden called Stefan Brené and Lars Olsson, and they clearly, they were the one doing all the groundbreaking brain research on gambling. So they showed with, you know, the MRI of the brain that a process addiction acts exactly the same way on the reward center as a drug does. It's just that it is something you do that creates that high or numbing, whatever effect you want from the drug uh, compared to you put something in yourself. So today we talk about addiction interaction disorder and we talk about intake addictions and process addictions. But I'm sure uh, Jane have talked about that, so you know that.
Uh, and you're more than welcome to put comments or questions in the chat. And I will be happy to go through that with you later because I know I talk fast. So, and I jump a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I'm a long talker. So whenever somebody talk, asks me to talk one hour, that's the most tricky thing for me because I usually have four day intensive where I talk for four whole days and evenings in a row. So you can imagine, it's hard for me to squeeze it into an hour because there's so much I want to tell you. But anyway, uh, meeting Terry Gorski was incredible for me. And from that day when I quit smoking then, uh, you know, in uh, September of 92, uh, is when uh, I met him in February and in September uh, 92, I was ready to take the step on my recovery day, but anniversary day for alcohol, the 27th of September, I quit smoking 1992. And a year later, I was very sick. Uh, and uh, I actually thought I had Lyme's disease or chronic fatigue or something because I was extremely tired. And today when I know about the symptoms of volatile blood sugar, how incredible sick your brain becomes from a blood sugar that goes up and down, up and down with anything from cold sweats to shakes, to irritation, nausea, diarrhea, to panic, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. I mean, you have the whole schmear you know of symptoms there's a long list of symptoms and uh if uh, jane hasn't shared it with you i'm happy to email it i think she has it otherwise uh you know uh, i'm happy to share because i think we need to know those symptoms we need to understand what volatile blood sugar means because a lot of us think that we are getting mentally crazy when it actually is the brain screaming because we are overloading it or we are starving it, you know, up and down, up and down. So, <clears throat> but actually I almost died twice, uh, not because I wanted to, but uh, I had, you know, this horrible, have you ever, you know, been so tired and when you sit and listen to a lecturer, you have to sit still that you start nodding you know, that horrible tiredness that just sweeps in over you and you can't stay awake. You just go, oh, and you nod and you nod. And I could sleep 14 hours a night at, during this period. And I could still, uh, you know, wanting to be frozen, had to go to the bathroom uh, and be extremely tired two hours later after I woke up. So twice I almost crashed with my car because I nodded behind the wheel. And that was purely due to all the sugar I was eating at that time. I can see that I didn't understand it at the time because you know you get biochemical denial or foggy brain or whatever you wanna call it when you feed the drug to your brain. You're not clear thinking. But once I quit the drug, I could look back and see and really feel scared. Oh my God, that was a close call. That was a close call. So uh, uh, I'm very grateful that I am where I am. And, uh, you know, i gotten all the tools I had. And my latest horrible relapse was when I was 48. So that's what now, that's 21 years ago. Um, and uh, that was when I went into menopause. Uh, and you think, you know, being a nurse, and also when I was young, I worked at the gynecological department, you would understand when you get it yourself, but actually I didn't. So when I'm 48 years old, I crash way, I mean, I had my drug up to my ears, and I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, so I go to my GP, and I start telling him about all the weird symptoms I have and think that I probably had some very strange tropical illness that fell down from the sky into me. I mean, I, I had no idea. This is embarrassing, you guys, but that was the way it was. So he looks at me. I, I had my little notes with me and I started reading all the symptoms. Did it, did it, did it. And he looks at me very calm and he said, well, 
that's menopause. And I almost fell off the chair. Uh, I had not got that point, you know. So uh, then, you know, a new area started. I had to start learning about that and all the hormonal changes and how that affected blood sugar and craving in my brain and oh. So that took a while too to learn a lot about that. Uh, but that was a really, uh, I've had some slips after that, but I wouldn't really call them relapses because slips is when, you know, you mess around with the food, but you don't abandon your recovery plan. Relapse, that's when you go way back and abandon your recovery plan. And, uh, you know, you quit going to meetings, you quit doing your recovery work and all the things you have, you know, all the tools you have gained in recovery. You quit all that and you go back. That's what I would call a relapse. Uh, so I've had, and also I like to compare it with other chronic illnesses. Being a nurse, I can see it is so similar to other brain illness like multiple sclerosis, which is a chronic illness that is about the brain. There are a few different types of multiple sclerosis. We know that today, but they are neurotransmitter and, and uh, you know, myelin um, problems in the brain. And uh, almost every chronic illness today have what they call flares and remission. And I think that's very good to think about for us too. You have a flare. I mean, you know, you slip or you fell on your butt or um, something triggered you. And I think the most important with that, that I think Gorski taught me was that if I do that, I'm not a bad person, not at all. It is because I have a chronic illness that is tricky to manage, especially in a word, you know, where cue-induced craving is the hardest for us, i.e. we see the drug, we smell the drug, we hear the drug, you know, like at a movie theater or, but, you know, um, we have the most sensitive brains of all people if we have developed an addiction. I'm convinced of that. And I used to say that that's a superpower, definitely a superpower that we have a sensitive brain, but it's gonna kill us if we don't get a new driver license on it. We definitely have to learn about our brain. So my favorite saying is that knowledge gives hope. Hope gives willingness and gi willingness gives action. The most dangerous thing we can do is analysis creates paralysis. We have to change behavior. And we have to start changing behavior. We can't wait until we're motivated. So uh, that is the trick to recover from this. Change behavior from now and on. You know, I used to uh, tell people things like, you know, if you brush your teeth with your right hand, start brushing with your left hand, walk backwards through the door opening, shock your brain and do all kinds of crazy things so that your brain go, oh my goodness, what's going on? Uh, because you need to start making new neurons. You, you need to become, uh, actually I almost say you need to fall in love with changing. Um, I don't mean you to be fanatic at that, but you have to dare change your behavior if you want to recover. Uh, you can't sit on your butt and take away the drug and think that you're going to re recover. It's not going to work. So you have to do things different. That's very much what I learned when I worked through my relapses. I can't stick to, you know, it's very comfortable to do like you always done, you know, have routines and you, you, you feel secure and safe, but you actually have to go out of the comfort zone and do things different. Uh, I think that's one of the most uh, important things that we have to learn. So that's what I've done. So the times when I have messed around uh, with my food plan, and also I like to say one more thing, um, which is very important. When I started 28 and a half years ago, we still had grain, but we had like brown grains. <laughs> we had fruit. Uh, we had low fat. Uh, you know, we had many different things from what I eat today. Uh, and uh, so that I would say was a uh, craving causing 
uh, food plan more than the food plans that I work with today, which is uh, low carb keto, which I have seen is, uh, I would say that uh, keto is by research too. I mean, uh, when I was in nursing school in 1973, um, they said that keto was a brain healing food plan. And I'm convinced it is. Then the whole industry have knocked us off, off our feet by, you know, all this stupid, you need to eat carb bullshit. Your sugar needs brain bullshit. Uh, that is one of the most dangerous things that happened to uh, mankind today. But we talked about that as, you know, for epilepsy, for children, for people that were sick in many, many ways, that that was the brain healing food plan. So, so uh, I'm not only, you know, had relapses and slipped through the years, but I have also very consciously adapted my food plan according to research and trial and error, trying new things. So uh, that's, of course, is another. Some, I know people could say to me, what? Why do you eat like that? Have you relapsed? I, uh, have you changed food plan? I uh, said, um, no, I haven't really changed. I've developed it, you know, <laughs> I, I've taken it a step forward. Uh, so I'm, you know, been doing that because so many things have happened through all the 28 uh, and a half years that I've been doing this now. Uh, so uh, that's basically my story. Um, and of course, you know, I, I always collect tools. Uh, because I also think there is one more thing to know about this illness. Uh, the further we go into recovery, the more cunning our illness will be with coming up with ways to get, up, get us off track. It gets sneakier. It's very sneaky. Cunning, baffling, powerful, and very patient. So I tell you, that's what it is. Bitten, what makes one's brain vulnerable to addiction? Well, that's, you know, we are all biochemically different. Uh, it is the drug that causes the addiction. It is when the drug or the process hits the reward center that we are all wired in the way that we will want to avoid uh, pain and we want pleasure. So anything that somebody, you know, feels like could be pleasure and they want more of that, that starts the addictive process. And then excuse, with- Excuse me a second. So sure. the, the, the rest of the question was, so I've always thought that um, when you have trauma, then you start using things to help to soothe yourself because there's nothing else to help soothe yourself. So that's part of my question. And why are some people's brains um, vulnerable to that? cascade that you just described and other people can have you know something and just go on because with they're born in that biochemically unique biochemically okay. unique that's just the way it is and actually there are three types of people we have the social users they can have one bite and nothing happens in their brain and they say sure felt good liked it no charge and then there are people the harmful users, they are the one that eat when they are unhappy, their loved ones left them, you know, you have that uh, romantic view of, of that, you know, then you go and eat or you're stressed or there are many reasons why a harmful user eats in a way that creates harm. An addict has no reason. It is the addiction that rules the whole process. So it starts with the drug hitting reward center that feels good. So then you will use that feeling good for everything. If it is sunshine, I'll eat. If it's raining, I'll eat. Do you see what I mean? So the dangerous thing is to start thinking that if you deal with your trauma, you quit using, uh-uh, because addiction has its own life process. That's what I like to, for us to understand. Because uh, my clients have been to therapy up and down and in and out, you know, hours and days and years. And that didn't touch the food until a sugar addiction specialist told them what to take away and start healing the brain. Then you can deal with your trauma, what's left of it. Because you have to understand, as long as you're on the drug, the trauma gets magnified within the, uh, the drug, drugged brain. You see what I mean? You can't think clear. You can't process things clear. So. You have to take away the drug first. 
Is that an answer? It's this, yes, and the sensitivity of the brain, what you said before, we're all very sensitive. That's part yeah. of the sensitivity. You're born in that way. Yeah. And, you know, be proud of it. It's a superpower. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Okay. Yeah, uh, we think chronic fatigue, that could be a severe volatile blood sugar problem that needs to be addressed with lots of treatment of the metabolic syndrome. You have to check for insulin resistance. You have to see what is making, you know, uh, your brain being nutritionally starved. It could be. And by the way, chronic fatigue and blood sugar swings go hand in hand. Chronic fatigue, that's adrenal fatigue. You know, your adrenaline is shut down. And every one of us that been an active addict have really worn down our pure adrenals because our, our adrenals are our bodyguards, the ambulance, you know, the police, they are the ones that respond for anything, small things, big things, when it comes to, you know, uh, sh shielding the body. So if you've been in an addictive life with, you know, taking in a drug, uh, which creates addictive thoughts, um, addictive false thoughts, I would say, addictive false feelings, uh, impulse, loss of impulse control and addictive behavior, your adrenals, you know, they are uh, absolutely worn down. I used to say uh, even eight guardian angels wouldn't help to send around you if that's been the case. You need a lot of restoration work. Menopause and relapse. Oh, man. Yes. And we need to be prepared because we get much, our brain gets much more sensitive to blood sugar swings, even small ones. And I like the way I read in a book about menopause that gave me a lot of knowledge that, you know, when we go into uh, our puberty, everything, our brains, our bodies are really rewiring and rechanging. And we go into menopause, it does that 10 times worse. So actually the brain catches fire. And if we keep the same behavior we have had through our life then by being, you know, big mama, caring, taking care of everybody, not setting ourselves first, uh, that's going to take a, uh, that's going to be a disaster. So we have to learn to relate to our body in a very different way. We need to understand the hormones, what's happening in our brain, that our brain going to rewire. You're not going nuts. You're rewiring. You're going to, you're going to be a more updated, better you but it takes a while. Uh, healing power of our connections groups. Oh, that's, uh, groups is incredible. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we need groups. We need professional groups, which is led by a professional that can guide us, teach us, tell us what to do, you know, the changes we're going to do, we need assignments, we need to read books, articles, watch things. It's like going to a high academic school, I'm telling you. That's what professional treatment is going to get you. Then you need support groups. The support group is helping you cope with doing the changes. Do you see the difference? So that's why you need both all the time. Well, a uh, uh, distinction between food addiction and sugar addiction and process addictions. Flour, flour is sugar. It's sugar molecules holding hands. So any flour processed food is sugar. It's included in the word sugar. I'm thinking about some people say to me, well, you know, I can overeat meat or fat. I can overeat anything. And then we're going to looking at volume addiction. That's a different ballgame. Okay. Process addictions are very tricky and you have to work with them like drug addiction. Uh, whatever happens today, I'm not going to do it one day at a time. The first hit of the drug, so which we probably won't remember when it happened ever, you know, long time ago when we were exposed to the drug the first times we were little something happened in our brain, you know, there was a reaction, something fired off and we liked it. So we wanted to do it again. That memory, you know, from that uh, situation will never go away. We have to learn to live with that. 
that's like a scar in our brain. I think about it as, you know, a wound, but it has become a scar. You know, a scar can be sensitive to touch, but we know it isn't the open wound. You see the difference in how I'm thinking? So we don't have to be afraid when things happen. Oh, it's just my scar, you know. Uh, we all get scars, both inside and outside, and they are part of life and our development as human beings, our growth. But addiction memory circuit is, and that can be triggered at any time for the rest of our lives. You know, that urge or that longing. And when we know that, you know, we can deal with it. It is, if we think it's gonna go away and it's never gonna happen again, that's a dangerous story. So we can be much more relaxed. Like I used to say, I call my addictive personality for red dog and my healthy uh, part blue dog. I'm a dog lover. Uh, and then uh, I used to, when, when this happens to me, it doesn't happen very often nowadays. It's not very strong either, but it does happen. You know, that urge to, oh, I would like to, or it's, it's on like that. And one of the tools I use is that I just calmly say, oh, hi, are you visiting? Hi, cutie. You know, I make it a little humorous because I know in the old days I panicked and I thought, oh my God, uh, no, it's going to go to hell and I'm going to break into a relapse and it's going to be all bad and blah, blah, blah. I can't stop it. And of course I did because I panicked. I don't panic anymore. I just said, oh, hi, cutie long time. How you doing? And then, you know, of course, uh, my red dog says stuff like, shouldn't we, you know, eat this or do that or that. And I said, you know what? Good idea. That sounds nice, coozy. But you know what? We're not going to do it today. And then it's like, you know, a red dog goes to go and lay down in his basket again. Uh, because I don't charge on it. I don't get upset. I don't work myself up. I just say, oh, okay. Sounds fun, but not today. And I drop it and I go and do something else or think about something else. And if it would persist, my, my other favorite tool is to tell on my red dog. So I call my support net and I tell them, you know what my red dog told me to do? And usually we all have many years in the program and in recovery. So we laugh like crazy. I think it is hysterical funny that, you know, uh, that bomber came up with that. But we have to be aware, like any other client with any other chronic illness, like my friend Begitta, who's a doctor and she's MS recovery client. Uh, she doesn't panic if uh, her foot gets numb one day, which is, could be a symptom of a flare. She just thinks, hmm, what's happened? Have I walked too much or what did I do? Shall I go and lay down for a while? Should I, you know, take a supplement or just very calmly? We have to start, have that relationship with our illness because I think many times we fly off the handle when this happens and we think uh, we have to sort of be sick again. We can't stop it. There are many ways to stop it. So calling on the red dog is another one I love. So it is very strong and it is lifelong. It's like when I understood that, I surrendered to that. I, I quit fighting it. You know, do you understand what I mean? I said, oh, okay. So that's what it is. And then I have to deal with that. Fine. I'm not going to, you know, be crazy anymore. So those, that's one of the things I want you to, I can send uh, this to Jane if you want. And if you want this picture, because this picture helps me seeing that, yes, this will happen once, it's a little scar now, but I don't have to freak out. So that was one thing I wanted to share with you. Uh, and uh, we have talked about this. The old school uh, is that uh, this is an emotional, spiritual illness. It's not. It is what I taught, a reward deficiency. It's a chronic primary brain illness, but we have, as I said, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences. So we are underdeveloped in all four areas. So a good treatment plan, actually, what I taught my clients was that every morning you have a piece of paper with four squares and you say to yourself, okay, 
what am I going to do for my physical health today? What am I going to do for my psychological, mental, emotional health today? I.e., which recovery tools am I going to add in? What am I going to do for my social recovery today? What am I going to do for my spiritual recovery today? All these are equally important. It's like if you think of a chair with four legs, it has to be stable. Stability is the best. So someday we have to we might have to do more work on our emotional recovery and more than our physical because we already fixed a lot of that maybe or vice versa. So it's quite quite easy. We should always try to keep it simple. To have that, I don't do it physically writing anymore. I did for years, but I have it sort of in my. It's like I'm sure if somebody looked in my brain in the morning, it's like four squares in there. And, you know, it starts popping up things. Oh, I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. So I have my recovery tools and today, oh, today I'm going to do this. And I mean, like today it was gorgeous weather. I have taken a long, long walk in the snowmobile tracks, uh, you know, along an old railway uh, in the sun. If it is snowstorm, I do something else for my physical health or whatever. So it's not the same thing every day. We should be uh, rigorous, but not rigid. Uh, anytime we try to be rigid, I have to do this all the time in my recovery. That's very dangerous because Red Dog is going to love that. You're going to say, oh, one day it's not going to work. And then I have her or him. <laughs> so, you know, be rigorous, not rigid. Uh, so actually, uh, I say I'm a sugar addict, uh, but actually I should say I have the illness of addiction and my outlets have been alcohol, nicotine and sugar. That's a more correct terminology as of today when it is medical. Risk situation, that's anything that's going to happen. Like, oh, tomorrow I'm going to have a talk with my boss and I'm terrified. I feel miserable. I have flutter in my stomach and, you know... I'm scared or whatever. That's a risk situation, something that's going to happen. So then what I do tonight, I call three of you and I said, you know what? I'm going to meet my boss and I'm scared. And it's going to be right before lunch. And I'm afraid that it's going to be upsetting news and I might go and eat something at lunch or, or whatever. And then I say, Jane, what would you do if you were, if that was your problem? And Marge, what would you do? And Alice, what would you do? And all of you tell me, I would do this, I would do this, I would do this. Very simple. And I say, oh, good, okay. Uh, you know, then I put together my plan and that's how I deal with the risk situation. So I ask my support, I listen to what they say and I pick together my own little program. One thing Jane said was really good and Marge had another good one. I used two of those. What Alice said, I've tr I tried before, didn't work on me, so, but you know, we just help each other like that. Warning signs, those are tricky bastards because they are sneaky. And we have a lot of hidden warning signs. And this is, you know, a lot of behaviors that we have uh, that we call personal character defects in the program. I like them behavior quirks. Um, uh, I don't like the word uh, character defects because it's not something wrong with our character. We have learned uh, silly behaviors. So I like to improve my behaviors. I would never ever try to change my personality. Uh, I'm very proud of my personality, but I do work on my behaviors. So that is two very different ball games. And if people say you have to change behavior, if you hear that, it says, I'm wrong. You're not wrong. Of course, you're not wrong. You're not a wrong, a faulty person. But if somebody say, hey, you might want to think about, you know, improving your behavior in this area, I would say, yeah, you're probably right. Can you tell me what you see? I wouldn't be defensive. So that's what I say to myself. Ooh, I need to improve a little bit here. And I practice improving. And then, you know, it comes in a more positive way. So warning signs, that's feelings, you know, inside. Uh, like when I do this with clients, I give you an example. People say, you know, warning sign is being home alone. 
because I risk eating. No, I say, it's not. That's a risk situation. You see the difference where I'm talking about the risk situation, uh, but I'm in pain. I just lost my dog. I'm in grief. That's a warning sign. So then I know how to deal with that differently. Being home alone, I invite some friends over or I have an online 12 step meeting and that's not a problem. So I deal with that very easily. But how do I deal with grief? Well, I need to contact other people. I need a different type of support because that's an emotion inside of me. Or I'm very angry uh, at the bus driver because it cut me off in the lane and I almost crashed, you know, in the snow. And, and do you, do you, uh, you're trying to understand what I mean? Then you have to work with that in a different way. Is this a, a behavior that I need to improve? Or was it uh, uh, an accident that this happened? Or what was it? Or is it long-term uh, feeling sorry for myself pattern that I have brought on me in my addictive life? Or could it be from trauma when I was a kid? Why is these feelings you know, constantly hampering my recovery? Then you have to plan for that. So warning signs is different. Sure. Wow. Thank you, Bitten. Uh, <laughs> as, as always, um, even though, you know, I, I've heard all of this information before, you know, I, I try and work it and present it coming from you. There's always many more layers and reminders, and it's always good to hear your story of, of um, addiction recovery. And I think most importantly to know none of, none of us gets this perfectly. This is a, a very humbling disease. Forget about perfect. Oh, Exactly. That's the, yeah. Perfectionism is the disease of addiction uh, yeah. and yeah. Um, very dangerous. That's it. That's it. So, you know, the fact that we are all here, we're all continuously trying one day at a time uh, to be in recovery means that yeah. we are in recovery. We're not in Absolutely. recovery. These are Absolutely. little slips and we just keep learning more about the disease and how to stay ahead of it. The more we keep showing up, I think that's the the main take home message that we got from your Absolutely. story today. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank Take you care, so you much, guys. Yeah. Live we'll softly. See. We'll.